you can't see that's the thing you can't really ask for dancing that if you ask it kind of spoils the mood it's supposed to be like a flow thing but now you're like yeah do it and i'm just like what's not man it's not yeah. how this works well you are the only person that's not of color so the rhythm thing kind of yeah. yeah yeah don't you know i get that too i, I know that i mean that's kind of why i do it is to to assert my uh <laughs> What you know to to assert like my racial foothold early so that yeah. people are like okay you know he's gonna put it out there out front so we can't mock him too much for it. No, yeah. I mean generally us just as as a matter of being pure gentlemen, we're not really gonna mock our melanin challenge brethren and and have to like <laughs> you know like there's already enough going on with the rhythm and all that and it's like yeah, let's just let him cook you know what I mean we'll we'll let him we'll just give him some leeway and we'll be on our merry business. I mean, hey, it's cool. You know, he grew up dancing to, you know, the tune of a guitar. He grew up with the beat of a drum. So, you know, it's two well, you know, two I levels to this. Like, I, uh, you know, I hear, uh, what's it? Um, damn it. Now I'm forgetting. Hall and Oates, mm. come on. Hey. I'm like, this is my music. I'm. Gr this is the music of my people. I mm. hear it. You know, it's like the scene in The Jerk. Where like suddenly the smooth jazz comes on and all of a sudden he's got rhythm. He's like, "Oh my god, what is this?" Hall and Oates is kind of a cheat code, though. Like that that's, is that's, that's, like, yeah. Hall I mean, and Oates. So you got Hall and Oates, uh, the but that, Dewey that's Brothers. That's Michael that's it's it's wait, not wait. bad music. I'm not saying it's bad music, but it's like suddenly oh. the, the one time where like, wait, I get how rhythm works. Right. Oh yeah. You know? No, that's what I'm saying. Like it's a cheat code because like it automatically just infuses you with rhythm. So. Yeah. <laughs> You know, now, now, if you were like, oh, man, Frank Sinatra came on. Mm, there we go. I'm like, ah. Yeah. 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 Mm. True. Yeah, pump, get some of that Frankie Valley right into my veins. <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck okay. goes into that? I'm on not... that note, welcome, everyone, to the MMA Vivid section with me, Zane Simon, and my co-hosts, Victor Rodriguez and uh, Dio. I almost said Martinez. I, I was waiting. I was <laughs> waiting for it. I was waiting for it. watch this motherfucker say Martinez one more time. Watch, <laughs> and it didn't happen. So that's good. It more didn't happen. Points. It didn't we happen. Are, we are here to talk about Invicta FC twenty eight. Um, this weekend's big Invicta card. Uh, honestly, there's a big Cage Warriors card that I should have set something up for too. But I thought I was gonna have a bunch more shows to do this week, and I ended up with not as many. So whatever. We're doing the Invicta card. That's the priority. Uh, going down this Saturday on Fight Pass from the Union Event Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, headlined by Mizuki Inoue versus uh, Verna Jandaroba for the strawweight, Invicta strawweight title. Fight I'm actually pretty excited for. Yeah. Yeah. This was usually when there's like a fight. They get canceled and somebody else has to get moved in. It's like, ah, I don't really. But this one, I mean, anytime Mizuki anyway is fighting. And then after we saw what Jim the Robo can do, like, it's like, this is a legitimate match that either of them, you could take either of them right now, put them into the UFC and they would thrive. You know, yeah. like, there's no questions as to, ah, eh, maybe they might flounder. It's like, no, these are two top level uh, people. So, yeah. No, it's the original. It's gonna be good. The original fight between uh, Jandaroba and Morandian was actually it was a good fight, but this actually is a lot more exciting, uh, and especially from a, a technical standpoint and how they match up. So yeah, it, it kind of I don't want to say that it's addition by subtraction because I don't want to be mean, you know what I mean? But like in a way, it turns out that this kind of works out better. Both of these have tremendous upside, and it just sucks that one of them's got to lose. Yeah, I don't think it's I, going out of your way to say that Mizuki Inoue is a better fighter than Janice oh, no. Bond. And no, 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 no. She is. Like She is. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, bottom of this card is a little thin on the ground, so we're going to go a little quick through that, honestly. I know, you know. Rock, this, paper, scissors, shoot. When we get through the quick stuff, there's not going to be that much left over, but these things happen, dude. Invicta's going a little bit that sort of I mean they have to. They're they're scraping talent, sending it to the UFC. So they're picking up a lot of people who are one and oh, oh and oh, two and oh, oh and one kind of stuff. 
And uh, we got to, it gets into a little bit of that Bellator treatment where you just kind of like, ah, there are fights down here. I don't know. Who cares? Let's move on. So uh, right. we're not going to be quite that bad, but we'll, we'll try to keep these bottom few short. Card opens with a flyweight bout between Tracy Cortez and Caitlin Neal. Anything specific you're looking for in this fight, Vic? Uh, no, just uh, something that I should mention, at least for the first two fights on this event, is that um, they're, they're all fighters that have had some amateur experience. They're not coming in, you know, like 1-0, and and then they're jumping straight into the professional uh, arena. So that's actually pretty good here. Cortez, 6-0 and is an amateur. Uh, Neil, 4-2. and They're starting off. I mean, it's kind of fair that they should be facing each other, given their level of experience. Uh, really not that much to say as far as the records are still developing. There's a lot of swing and cling on this card overall. I'm going to say that right now. There's a lot of the striking. That's just a matter of getting in and missing a punch and grabbing the back of the neck and then just working on, uh, grappling from there. So, uh, oh, we that may head and arm there. takedown is going to be out oh, there. Yeah. It's it, it, the head and arm drinking game. Um, it, it might, <laughs> it might kill your liver today. Uh, and the fight isn't even until, you know, Saturday. So, uh, but yeah, it, it, this, this could be fun. You can see a lot of fun scrambles out of this. Don't expect anything too pretty in terms of technique just yet. You picking anyone? Ah, right now I'm going to pick Cortez. She is slightly more experienced and, uh, she has been oh. facing, um, uh, opponents that look a little more, you know, that, that have been more athletic than her and doing well. So yeah. Dio, you want to flip the coin for me? Uh, actually, that was one of the few where I was like, I could actually find, you know, a decent amount <laughs> about her. And she looks pretty scrappy com comparatively to uh, Neil. And she, like Vic said, she has just off of the look of it. She has dealt with people that are seem to be a bit more skilled and a bit more just athletic all around. So I'm going to go with Cortez on that one. All right. Up next, Jillian DeCourcy versus Rebecca Levine, a... Uh... Adam Weight fight, Levine, a training partner of um, oh, the former UFC title challenger who debuted with Ronda Rousey in the first UFC women's fight. Um, Liz Carmouche. Liz Carmouche. There we go. Yes. Training partner Liz Carmouche for uh, is Rebecca Levine. God, I'm getting all Goldbergy here. Jesus. Um, <laughs> Corn nuts. Corn <laughs> to Dorsey returning for the second time in the Invicted Kick Cage. Dio, any thoughts about this fight? This fight? Uh, from what we saw, like we actually did get to see, uh, I believe it was the last one. We got to see the Corsi uh, fight previously. And, yeah. you know, it was a decision, but we did see that at least she is, you know, somewhat good at what she does, uh, which as you can, like, because we talked about it a little bit uh, more and we've seen it in prior cards too. We're seeing more women that actually have amateur backgrounds getting into it. Uh, Cause before, you know, a few years ago, you used to just, okay, you are good in the gym. So we're just going to throw you into a pro fight. <laughs> and then you would end up getting fed to somebody that already has like six or seven fights and just get stumped. So, with these two, you know, it should be competitive uh, since they are essentially still on the same level. They're both 1-0 as of now. Uh, being that we saw DeCourcy before, I'm going to go lean towards her. Yeah, I mean, Levine making her debut with Gladiator Challenge doesn't really tell you anything before no. ahead of this. So, yeah. Vic, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to agree. I was going to make that exact point. Um, I really can't put too much... Oh, really, dude? Really? Really? <laughs> you paying rent in this motherfucker? What are you doing here? Making all that noise? What's going on? Exactly. Yay. Hang on. So anyway, uh, Levine, <laughs> he's fine. Trust me. Uh, Levine is is uh, definitely a very strong, um, you know, strong for her size type fighter. And the thing that gets me about this is, I mean, both of them, you know, okay. So DeCourcy's 4-0 as an amateur Levine is 3-0. Both of them have one submission on the amateur ranks. Again, a lot of growth still to come from both of them. This is only their second fight um, on, on each side. And, you know, they're both really trying to figure this stuff out. There's going to be a lot of pressing against the cage, a lot of scrambles, a lot of stuff of that nature, uh, attacking the legs, maybe a few foot stomps if we're lucky. And um, why are you laughing like that, dude? Okay, there we go. So uh, I'm going to actually go with DeCourcy because her game looks a little more polished so far. She looks like 
she's got a few more um, tricks up her sleeve in terms of, you know, keeping her fight IQ where it needs to be and not just letting instinct take over, which is where I worry right now about Levine's skill. And I have no doubt that both of these are, uh, both these fighters are actually going to do pretty well later on. I mean, I'm not going to say that either one's going to be like a future champion or anything like that, right. but they both seem to have the makings right now and the fundamental, the foundation um, that a good fighter would need in order to progress in their future. And, you know, you can expect good things, but for now it'll probably be a pretty fun fight, but it won't be pretty in and of itself. Right. <laughs> All right. Following that, we've got a flyweight bout. Chelsea Chandler making her debut, a Gracie uh, jiu-jitsu fighter. She's a Gracie jiu-jitsu fighter um, against Carrie Kennison, 2-0, both women making their debut for Invicta overall. And uh, Vic, what are your thoughts on this real quick? Well, problem is there is no uh, footage of any kind for Chelsea Chandler. She does yeah. not have a, uh, a single amateur fight uh, to speak of. She's making her professional debut. They must have seen a lot out of her and on the jiu-jitsu mats to say, yeah, you're going to come in and, and have her a debut that, here. They so. just have a lot of faith in Cesar Gracie as a – Cesar Gracie fight team as a producer of talent, you know. Yeah, Somebody which is – yeah, it's it's totally possible that there's something like that going on where, you know, you, you have a really good agent and they bring some eyeballs in and say, hey, let's let's take a gamble on her and see what happens. I mean, the worst that you can end up with is that she ends up 0 and one, but she's right. still it's not an indication that she's going to be a failure or anything like that later on. I mean, it all depends. Right. She might very well be some wild. Yeah, athlete. Because, I can't. Right, yeah, I can't. I can't speculate or make a pick on this because, you know, it is what it is. But. Kennison's got some experience. Four and one is an amateur. One submission. Uh, her one loss as an amateur was a knockout. I don't know if that's going to play into anything here. But two and zero is a professional with one submission. So we might see some fun ground action here. All right, Dio. Any thoughts? Anything to add to that at all? This is either a setup <laughs> for <laughs> to feed somebody to Kennison, or Chandler is like the next Ronda Rousey. Like that's, that's, there's only like two things that's going about here. Like when you already have somebody that has multiple, you know, that has a good amount of amateur fights and two pro fights already going up against somebody that's O, O and O. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a bit rough. Like that kind of feels like, uh, what was it that they had, that we had on explode fights a while back where it was like, Oh, watch soccer mom get knocked oh, out. No, no, no. <laughs> it's not that. Katie, God, Katie. She's out of a legit camp. We Poor Katie, no. no. No, I'm just saying, like when you wait, like when you look at records, that's what like this is that's this is the feel that I get from that. But you know, like I said, this could be she could be the next big thing. But being that we literally have we've got nothing. Like we nothing. don't even have training footage on her, so we can't even kind of speculate about it. My 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 feeling on the Caesar Gracie thing is it's probably something like Chris Avila kind of thing where you know she'll be she'll have a, a few skills to her but at the end of the day you, you know Chris Avila was like oh they're like oh he's you know trains with the Diaz boys they're talking about him as one of their top prodigies and all that and he just kind of got shut out of the UFC right yeah he he was he was kind of promoted as like you know uh, the next like a uh, like they did with uh, Harold Miner right baby jordan and all that shit yeah. it's like yeah <laughs> that's not that's maybe they have some mannerisms in common but that doesn't mean that you're going to find no. It. no no absolutely not all right that brings us to a strawweight bout uh Cal Schwartz versus K Hansen Schwartz 1 and 1 Hansen 1 and 0 oh. Both or let's see, Schwartz having fought both of her two pro fights in Invicta so far, and Hansen having uh, also her only pro fight in Invicta. So two women who whose entire pro careers have been fought on in Invicta to date. Right. Dia, any thoughts on this fight? Uh. Cal Schwartz is like ridiculously strong. Like I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys saw her in like the past fights. That is equal parts a pro and a con for her because a lot of times she just relies on that. It's like, okay, wrestling time and big throw. But then after that, it's kind of like, I don't really know what else I'm doing here. Uh, so she's still pretty raw. And if like she can refine that, she could be, you know, a legit threat down the line. Um, but from what we saw in the prior fight with, with both of them, uh, I'm going to go with Hanson just on the fact that 
Kyle Schwartz gets to be very tunnel visioned on stuff. And if they end up scrambling, it's very possible that uh, Schwartz will get caught with something. So, all right. Vic, your pick? Yeah, you know, I think that there's something with uh, Schwartz as she gets a little hung up on, um, you know, once she gets her wrestling down, I think it's like she her mind is still stuck in wrestling mode right. and there isn't as much of a follow up as perhaps there could be. And I don't know, maybe some people are like that. Maybe she's much more of like favoring keeping control and, and position and that can be worked on. I'm not saying that like this is not a knock on her or anything like that, right. but it's just a habit that I've kind of noticed from from her uh from what we've seen in her thus far who knows maybe she might have fixed it already for this fight and uh her opponent might be in for a world of hurt so you, you never really know um but i am actually excited on, going for a ride like we know that much like if she uh, gra- if she gets those paws on you it's going to be a big spectacular slam at least one or t- once or twice in the fight so. If she can do half of what she did to Van Soost in this fight to Hanson, uh, I think that's, you know, and that was a hell of a coming out party too. So, I mean, it, that's uh, that, that's something that left a lasting impression. It unfortunately does set a, a higher bar for expectation than what should perhaps be fair for someone who's only one and one. But right. uh, Hanson is not a joke, dude. She is scrappy. She is very much one of these opportunists that, you know, you leave an arm hanging out a little too far and she's immediately going to start working for it. And she's very, very quick at clinching, um, you know, like, for example, going for an arm bar, immediately getting the knees together, working her way to establish her position and then start cranking. Um it's it's actually really cool to see how it's like snapping like a like a Venus flytrap type thing going on with her submission attempts. Now they're not always successful, but you know she's she's working on it and it's it's looking good. So um, yeah, we're, we're going to see a lot of fun grappling in this one. Unless we get a sloppy kickboxing match, we should be seeing some really really fun chain grappling. And um, yeah, I, I'm going to go with Schwartz on this one mostly because of the athleticism, power, and just the ability to control. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Hanson pulled the rabbit out of a hat here and got a good submission there somewhere maybe in the second round. round. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have the odds yeah. coming up for the uh, top four fights on the card. But from now, we're just sticking, uh, blowing through them because there's no odds for these early bouts. Yeah. Brings us to another Adam Weight bout. Mina Grusander versus Fernanda Priscilla. Priscilla and are both women making their Invicta FC debuts. Priscilla from Brazil, Grusander from Finland. And Vic, what are your thoughts on this fight? Well, this was going to be a little weird one. Uh, Priscilla is pretty raw with her athleticism, but really, really good at uh, getting top control and working her jiu-jitsu. Whereas Grusander is not a bad fighter, but she's very content to hang back. And, you know, if you start pouring volume on her it's you know it takes a little time for her to be able to push forward and work her way back now i will say this she does have some really good finishes on her record uh grusander's got some really smooth submissions in fact her last three uh, fights uh, she had her lone loss to siri kondo and pancreas and there's no shame in that because kondo is actually pretty damn legit right now and uh three wins in a row all three of them finishes two uh one tko and two submissions both of them chokes i mean She's got a lot going on with her grappling arsenal, but it's going to take a while to get out of that first gear and actually get her grappling going. But when it comes to the stand-up, she's not really that um, active. And I really think that that's going to probably weigh in against her. But Priscilla's not a slouch on the ground either. Um, I'm going to say that if it stays standing, Priscilla's probably going to be able to uh, do more damage over time. But I kind of feel that Grusander, not just because of her experience, but because of the way her style of grappling in particular, I feel that she's more likely to win this one, uh, probably by a late submission. So I'm going to go with Grusander on this. All right. Dia, your thoughts? <clears throat> I'm also going with Grusander on this one. But and this is like one of those ones where it was, uh, had we not had a opponent that we've actually – seen like you know multiple times whether it be in pancrase or seen them fight in the ufc like uh, with condo um this was one of those was gonna be one of those ones where it's like okay you've got someone from brazil that we don't really have a lot on and then you know when you look at uh their opponents records and then the same thing uh, with the european scene uh but from what we have seen you know like how Vic broke it down like her striking's not all that great, but then again, the one person that we've seen fight in the UFC who was Kondo is like she's pretty high level. So that's not 
to say, you know, that she's like absolutely terrible. She just got pieced up by somebody that's going to piece up 80% of the rest of the fighters in the world at that weight class. A grinder. So, yeah. 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 So I am uh, going to go with Grusan on this one. All right. That uh, brings us to the first bout. We actually have odds for, and the mo the first really recognizable name on this card, Pearl Gonzalez versus Callie Robbins. And Dio, what are your thoughts on this? Ah, uh, Pearl Gonzalez. The UFC's failed, one of their failed projects that we had. Um, you guys probably remember Pearl Gonzalez from like the, I guess it was Implant Gate. <laughs> If you want to call it that or whatever, stop uh, adding. Stop adding gate to where. That's so lazy. I don't like. Shut that up. Shit. Shut up. Okay. Shut up. I will put gate on whatever I damn well please. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so as we like, we've seen her fight before. We've seen Callie Robbins fight uh, multiple times uh, before at this point. So uh, from what we've seen from both of them, I'm gonna have to go with <clears throat> Callie Robbins on this one, just because she's just an all around kind of better in every aspect like Pearl Gonzalez is you know is good but she has too many deficiencies in too many different areas for me to be like oh yeah she's that's who I'm gonna root for she would make an excellent poster uh fighter for Invicta if she does but I kind of go with Callie Robbins on this one all right Vic what are your thoughts well, here's my problem with this. Like, on the one hand, Gonzalez got rushed into the UFC. Um, you know, she had back-to-back -back losses against Cynthia Calvillo, who, which a loss that actually looks pretty good in hindsight, looking at she how well Calvillo didn't exactly got. get rushed into the UFC. She started fighting in 2012, didn't get to the UFC until 2017. And no, no, no. Hold on a second. Wasn't she a, wasn't she a replacement? Uh. I think so, no? Or unless I could be wrong. I don't know. Let I me might see. Be... On that two, UFC 210 fight card. Let me see here. Uh, I don't no. know. Let's see. 217. She no, fought. No, 210. 210. No, you know what? No, she was not. Okay, yeah. never mind. Never mind. All right. So, you know, she'd been fighting for a while. But the problem is that even though she came in, she fought a buzzsaw in Calvillo, and she fought a pretty established fighter in Botelho. The problem that I have is that um, you can forgive those losses, but none of her wins prior to being in the UFC, save for one, has been against someone who had a winning record at that time. Yeah. And that is never a good sign. So unless she has sharpened things considerably since then, I mean, I don't know, dude. I, I don't really think that, uh, you know, there, there was that earlier loss against Courtney Casey, actually. That's, so that's two, because Casey was 1-0 at the time. Um uh, I, yeah, I, I just don't know that even for someone who's been fighting for as long as she has, uh, she hasn't really made the refinements that you would expect for someone who's done. So, and I understand life gets in the way. She's had some personal trouble and all that, but okay. Callie Robbins is sharp, dude. I mean, she's already, she, she doesn't have any of that, um, any of that latency, I guess you could call it. And that one win over Sharon Jacobson probably means more than any of the wins that Pro Gonzalez has had on her record. So yeah. I'm going to have to go with Callie Robbins just for being a much more aggressive striker, having better volume, more accuracy, and a hell of a scrappier submission game. Yeah. Well, Pro Gonzalez is always going to be held back just from the fact that she's really foot slow and kind of uncoordinated. I mean, there's not a lot you can do to change that in the end. You yeah. Know? No. The lack that's of athleticism is like, and that's, you see that with a lot of fighters. Uh, yeah. More so, and I hate to say it, but like more so when you come when it comes to women's fighting, because a lot of times, just when it comes to the whole societal thing, more often than not, women get into fighting far later yeah. than men do, because it's not something that is culturally ingrained in most Western societies. So well, that, and you're also just plumbing a much thinner talent pool. I mean, you can for, see at the bottom of this card, Invictus picking up anybody who. You know, anybody who's willing, basically, if you get people who are up zero and zero, one and oh, right. all that, you're just, you're, you're, you're scraping from a much thinner talent pool. So you're getting people who are doing this and who are dedicated. And that's the big thing is the dedication. Right. You see the same shit at heavyweight in men's MMA, where it's just yeah. like, yeah. are you dedicated to weighing 250 pounds and punching people? You might get a UFC shot out of it, you know? Hey, Greg Hardy's knocking on that door, you, you know? Yeah. Oh, God. 
I mean, <laughs> but it, but it proves your point. I mean, you, yeah. you have somebody who came in as an athlete. Well, there you go. No combat sports experience, and he's in his thirties. That's kind of what happens in some cases of women's MMA. We see women in their thirties come in and do it. So it's what it is. We should probably not bring up Greg Hardy on a show about yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's wow. Mm. Let's give that a, a, a that that asshole a pass. Anyway, um. Odds on the fight, Callie Robbins is currently the favorite, opened at minus 150, or plus 150 a few hours ago, or day ago, and is now minus 165. So she's adjusted from an underdog to favorite pretty rapidly. Gonzalez opening at minus 190, now at plus 128. So, yeah, Pearl Gonzalez opening at minus 190 was probably not a great idea for whoever started that book. No, that's probably name value and like you know recent yeah. uh, name value of recent opposition as well. You yeah. know that's probably what it is. Like this could be uh, this is definitely an opportunity for Callie Robbins to make a name. Off yeah, of so. that's, a, that's a big scout. All right, that brings us to a women's flyweight bout: Milana Dudieva versus Christina Marks. Two UFC vets, Marks most recently on the tough inaugural season for. Yeah. Filling the UFC's women's flyweight division and Dudieva, a former bantamweight in the UFC. And Vic, what are your thoughts on this fight? Yeah, not good. Um, neither one of them, you know, look, man, I, I want to be as uh, as polite as possible with any fighter that, that we're talking about. But let's be real here. Dudieva has only really succeeded against opposition that has not been very, very great. Um, probably the biggest name that I can see on her record is going to be Elizabeth Phillips, who herself has struggled tremendously, especially in recent years. Um, you know, it, it's a problem. Every time that she's fought someone who has been, you know, on a, a considerable skill level, she falters. Penny Kanza, Jessica Andrade, Juliana Pena, Marion Renault, like every name that's big here, you know, it, it, it's she hasn't shown the signs of improvement to really – give me any sort of confidence that she's going to be able to break through where she's been in the last two, three years. However, she's going to be taking on someone who's eight and nine as a professional. And look, some of this was, um, I don't want to say it was necessarily strength of schedule. I think that uh, Marx was probably forced in, or not forced. She was rushed into some fights that she shouldn't have taken. Yeah. Uh, early losses to Maida Arsa and Sarah McMahon. Uh, Arsenal, who she fought twice. Uh, Michelle Ould back in 2011. Like, those are probably not fights that she should have been taking. And not, you know, it just it just hasn't really worked out for her in terms of the numbers game. But I will say this. In Marx's defense, her record is, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be what it is. I think there's much more a case of mismanagement and maybe overestimation in her athleticism and her ability. Uh, I think I'm going to see this as more marks rushing and immediately trying to uh, work a clinch. You know, a lot of wild slinging, Dudieva trying to do more accurate striking, picking apart from a distance and disengaging. And then once on the ground, we're going to see a little more of a slicker game from Dudieva and eventually working her way to a decision, maybe a submission somewhere later in the fight. But, you know, it just is what it is, man. This is not – you get who you can, I suppose, for fights like this. Yeah. Uh, Dion, what are your thoughts on the fight? Who are you picking? Uh, I'm going to go with Marks on this one just because, like, that slide that Dudia has been on has been. Ah, that, mm. that's, that's been something. And, like, you can, like, so everybody that she's lost to, of course, anytime she faces anybody that is worth, you know, anything at all, uh, she loses. And the two cancel bouts that she has, or one of the cancel bouts with Valerie Letourneau or Jermaine Randami, she would have gotten washed by either of them as well, uh, from what we know about each of them before. So, I, yeah, for me, it's just kind of hard to pick her either way, because she just has so many glaring, 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 glaring uh, weaknesses and Marks is you know she has her own deficiencies as well uh, but like Vic said like that's a she has had a lot of I got rushed into this way sooner than I should have and with Duty Eva she's had plenty of time to stack her way up but then once she got thrown in with you know 
the higher level stuff, she's just kind of faltered every single time. So I don't think it's going to be a, a, a pretty win at all. This is probably going to be one of the uglier scraps of the uh, night. And I think I'm going to go with Marks, and this is probably going to be like a split decision. This is going to be one of those ones where it's like, uh, I don't really want to watch this fight again. Yeah, I, I got the feeling Dudyev is probably going to take us. This is this feels to me like the classic Dudyev uh, kind of decision fight she can take, where it's just the basic idea of being stronger is enough right. to get it done. Because yeah. Marks is just not a very good athlete. Could definitely see that. Yep. But on the other hand, all Dudyev ever really knows how to do is throw people, which is like mm -hmm. really weird. She's incredibly good at throwing people. And then doesn't have a ground game to speak of and doesn't have a striking game. So it's just like, oh, man, did you see that amazing throw she hit? And now the woman's back up and punching her in the face. So yeah. She spent yeah. all her XP points on throws. And that was <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's been she, she's min maxing and not to good results. Right. I, I mean, that's the thing. Like when I when when Dudieva when she I think she first got to you, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, man. I've seen her look pretty good off her back. Uh, maybe, but then it's like, no, it hasn't panned out. It no. just hasn't, unfortunately. Dudieva is the favorite going into this, which is surprising off that four-fight losing skid, but nonetheless, opened at minus 260, jumped up to minus 187. Marks opening at plus 180, jumping down to plus 149. So those odds are getting closer to even, which I feel like they should be. My guess is this is probably going to be a pretty messy decision one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But uh, hard to hard to really – well, don't bet on it, but hard to bet on either woman as clearly being able to clearly run away with that kind of fight. Right. And that brings us to our co-main event, yes. Deanna Bennett. Karina Rodriguez, flyweight bout, and Dio, what are your thoughts? This is going to be fun. This is going to be real fun. Uh, Karina Rodriguez, who I believe we just saw her debut with Invicta on one of the prior events, and Deanna Bennett, we've known her for years now. We know she always brings it. Um, this is going to be – it's going to be an exciting fight. Like that's that. This is one of those when you have two people that are going to go after it the whole time, and I'm gonna go with Rodriguez on this one. Uh, yeah, like all I know is gonna be fun. <laughs> Vic will have a better uh, breakdown of it, but yeah, for me, this was the, the that this is like that one fight on every card where you're just like, you know what, this is gonna be the one that I'm gonna have the most fun. With, so. All right, Vic, who are you taking? Yeah, you know, I I, I really got to agree with Dio here. This is probably going to be, you know, we're, we're very much looking forward to the main event, but this is the one here that really might bring the meat and potatoes. And um, Bennett, I mean, look, all right, so she went through the Ultimate Fighter. She won her first fight there, and she lost to Sajara Eubanks with that ma monster fucking head kick that we saw. Ooh, that was um, Made her UFC debut and ended up in a draw with Melinda Fabian. I don't know how the hell that happened, uh, but that eventually – fight. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't, and, and Bennett did not look like her usual self either. I mean, that, the Fabian, no disrespect to her, but that's the kind of opposition I would expect Bennett to be able to really go out and beat. But uh, she got a release. She's back with Invicta. It's not, a, it's a great place to land back in. And mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, she is going to be taking on someone who's a much more lethal striker than people that she's faced in a while. Uh, I, I'm Rodriguez can crack, she can kick, she's got really good shot selection. This is her second Invicta fight, but she's on a three-fight win streak right now. Um, third. And she's Invicta sorry? Fight. Well, this will be her third. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, man, I, I just, I don't know, man. Her ability to mix levels and do everything that, that is necessary to keep someone like Bennett guessing really <laughs> makes me think that uh, Rodriguez is going to have – uh, a much easier time picking her apart from the outside. What I do think that Bennett can do is, you know, try to work some level changes and stuff like that, you know, be able to use her fence and everything to wade her way in. I'm just a little worried that she's going to get pieced up trying to get inside and make the fight go where she wants it to go. I think Rodriguez is just a little more, um, you know, she, she'll be able to expect whatever Bennett brings to her. And, um, you got to stop doing that, dude. You got to stop doing that. Please. Thank you. He sounds like he's crying. Like, what the fuck is he doing? Like, I'm looking at him. He's smiling his ass up. But, um, 
Yeah, man. I, I don't know. I, I don't really I don't really see too many avenues for Bennett to win this, but it's a fight game, man. I, I'm still gonna go with Rodriguez on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that entram gym that uh, Rodriguez trains out of has produced, been producing some pretty good fighters, especially as strikers. They've been producing a lot of really functionally talented fundamentals kickboxers who've been having a lot of success lately. So yeah, they've been fighting smart, and they, they they seem to whatever philosophy it is like they, there is there are some minor patterns that you notice across the board for these guys. So whatever they're doing is working out, man. Yep. And the fact that she trains with uh, the, uh, gosh, I just forgot their names again. Er- uh, Irina Aldama and um, the other fighter from that. Gym. Alexa Grasso. Alexa Grasso. Like, she trains with them all the time as well, too. So, like, yeah. that's, uh, you know, the whole iron sharpens iron uh, thing that MMA fighters love to quote. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Which is it's also which- hard to, know- to, to forget how flat. How flat Bennett looked against somebody tall and rain, tall and rangy who could work a range game in her last fight against Melinda Fabian. Yeah, yeah, like, that, yeah. That's funny too because Rodriguez actually fought Grasso, lost to her a while back. So, yeah, yeah. Rodriguez coming in there at five foot seven for a flyweight, like yeah. that's yeah, that's tall. That's that's quite tall. Yeah. Um. All right. Odds on that bout. Karina Rodriguez is a big favorite at the moment. Open at minus 210, has dropped down to minus 252 in the time since. And Bennett opened at plus 160, is all the way up at plus 186 in like the one day since these odds have opened. So. Right. Those are climbing in a hurry. Mm-hmm. That brings us to our main event. Mizuki Inoue, Verna Jandaroba, and... Vic, what are your thoughts? You know, it's kind of a shame. Uh, I mean, I'm glad that they're both getting an opportunity to fight for a title because they are both championship caliber fighters. But the reality of it is they both probably should be in the UFC already. I mean, they're they're both really, really talented in different ways. You know, uh, in a way, we've seen her uh, be super slick with her striking and round out the rest of her game. Bug, I will be there in a moment. Relax. Whereas Jandaroba's just got a really aggressive grappling style and she's just super, you know, like she's a very um, hard-nosed athlete. She's really good at for a jiu-jitsu person to, to, to implement their takedown game in MMA the way she does. Uh, it's pretty, it, she's a pretty scary person, man. Uh, it's it's really, uh, it's really going to be interesting for me to see how Inouye deals with this because Jandaroba is definitely a lot stronger and she presents some problems as far as not having a usual takedown game, right? She'll be able to grab a single leg, turn a corner, and if that doesn't work, turn yet another corner. So uh, I'm interested in seeing how Inouye deals with that and, and being much more, um, being the leaner fighter, I guess, or the more slender fighter of the two. But at the same time, Inouye has patience. And even though that may cost her on the judges' scorecards for some fights, uh, if she's able to stay standing most of the fight, she should be pretty much okay here. So, hang on, sir. my guy, the fuck, come on. So yeah, I, I'm actually, I, I think that Inouye is gonna have some great looks here, but I'm gonna go with Jandaroba controlling here. All right, Dio. Oh yeah, so, you gotta go discipline his child. I know. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a tough one because we haven't seen Mizuki in a way fight since twenty six July of twenty sixteen. So already, like that's always a bad sign to come back to. And she was injured uh, and had to pull out of her last fight. So I, my heart wants to go with Mizuki in a way, and you know because we've seen what she can do. Um, and but. It's two and things. She's the hardcore like, MMA crush. So, you know. Yeah, she is everybody's MMA crush. So, uh, but she is the taller fighter in this one. So, uh, there's that as well. Like, uh, even though uh, Janda Roba is a more physical, like, just a more physical, athletic, uh, built uh, athlete than anyway is, um, that height factor can make a difference. And while she, Janda Roba does have the strength. Is definitely going to have a strength advantage and things like that. Uh, if Mizuki is com- is one hundred percent, sure, she'll probably get taken down a few times, and you know. But if this stays standing for any 
long periods of time, she is going to light just about anybody in the world uh, on fire when it comes to the striking. So I don't know. It's it's kind of tough on this one. I'm I don't think either of them are going to be able to finish the other uh, in this fight. I think it's going to go the distance. Um, I'm just going to, you know, hope for in a way I'm aside with her on this one, but would not be surprised if Jandaroba is able to just completely power through her. Yeah, it's kind of an it's an interesting take, especially because in a way has she's definitely struggled against better athletes. Right. But most of the better athletes that ha she struggled against, especially lately, are women who can outstrike her. Right. Who can actually just make her pay for the fact that she doesn't have a lot of power. Right. That she doesn't have a lot of power and that she uh is always hyper aggressive and willing to kind of walk into stuff and you know mix it up in exchanges that she won't necessarily come out ahead in. You know, Alexi right. Grasso beat her doing that. Yeah. Karolina Kowalkovich beat her doing that. Otherwise, her only other recent loss in MMA is a DQ. So, yeah. The, the other thing being, she's never been submitted. So yeah. if Jandaroba's if Jander, if Jandaroba's athleticism is going to come mostly into play with taking in a way down and out grappling her, could be that that avenue is just not going to get her anywhere. Like, right. It could he, end up being a stalemate. Yeah. Or, I mean, it could just mean that, you know, if Jandaroba's not doing enough damage in any of her positions that she gets, it's going to come down to, in a way, in a way, volume winning her rounds so yeah i i, I just feel that a lot. <laughs> it just seems to me that that in a way is probably going to run out of answers before gender robot does although gender robot's cardio might be a problem too yeah i mean but does in a way ever really run out of answers i don't know that she like her problem seems to be that she can just be out muscled and pushed around but yeah. it's mostly being out muscled and pushed around by better strikers than her yeah i get some it, like you said every it's always been somebody that is more athletic that is on either the same level or a higher level of striking than she is like you have to have like outside of having just a you know a lot of power in your strikes not really going to be too much that you're going to be able to do there and from what we've seen from jandero but she is serviceable on the feet but not on the level of anybody that has beaten in a way, uh, thus far, you know, when you've got when your only losses, you know, legitimate losses are against uh, Carolina Kovalkovic and a Alexa Grasso, like that's you've got two people that are pretty that's that's like the cream of the crop, two people that are already in the UFC, you know, have had their tours uh, in Invicta prior to this. So, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, I, I came into this kind of thinking I'd be leaning towards Jandaroba, but I'm actually picking away in this just, just because I think she can she can actually score the points in in ways that matter in rounds. But we'll see. Um, I'm, I'm I'm pretty excited for that fight, honestly. Either way, I see them both getting called up to the UFC soon. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, not that it won't leave Invicta cards that much more bereft of notable talent, but. Yeah, but I mean, they are a farm league, and they are doing a very yeah, good yeah, and it's been a good, it's been a great place for uh, women to bounce back to too. Like you get, you know, your UFC tenure doesn't go that well. You, your time in the UFC doesn't go that well. You got a place to fall back, get fights, consistently perform, rebuild. Um, in a way, opened at minus one twenty, dropped all the way down to minus one sixty, and has bounced back up to minus one thirty. And Jandaroba opened at minus 120, so they opened dead even, went all the way up to plus 128, and is back down to minus 101. So those odds have, fluctu have fluctuated a lot since they've opened. Um, I like Inouye on that one. Anyway, uh, all told, like I say, it's, I think what we're seeing, this is a lot of how... It's not a far cry from, from how recent Invicta cards have been. It's probably a lot more like what they're going to keep looking like, where the bottom half is just right. people you've never heard of at all. And then the, the 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 last few fights are whatever veterans are still fighting with Invicta because 
any veteran talent that's successful there is going to get picked up in a hurry to the UFC, and they're just not going to last that long. Yeah, I mean, but, the, and, but that's the thing. Due to because that's the thing, Invictus. Before we would have those times where it was months and months and months and months in between each Invictus card. Now yeah. they are doing it more consistently. So the whole thing of okay, we got a lot of people that we don't really know at the bottom of the card. That's gonna fix itself pretty quick because yeah. these people are going. These women are going to get more fights under uh, their belts quicker than they did before. Instead of going, you know, having to go eight, nine months between fights, you might be able to get a fight every three months or so, you know, yeah. as long as you're not medically, as long as you're medically clear to do so. So this is yeah. a good thing. You know, it it's, is. it's, it might not be great for main value, but it's definitely good for women's MMA in the long run. No, I mean, it's why Invicta remains the foundation of women's MMA pretty much globally at this point right now is they're the, they're the organization most consistently putting together well booked women's MMA fights month you know month to month to month in ways that you know even organizations like Deep Jewels and places like that that have put on a lot of women's MMA over the years yeah not necessarily it, it's not well booked fights necessarily oh, no. It, no definitely not no I mean if you saw we've seen what Ren Nakai has been up to. Yep. Ren Nakai went back and she is feeding on cans left and right. She yep. will never leave that ecosystem ever again. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. There's Invicta is, they're really the only organization that is going to consistently be creating elite talent to go places like the UFC. Otherwise, it's going to be cherry picked people who have, you know, the one star that's going to come through like Jungle Fights or something. And they had that one yeah. woman who, they fed 10 fights to and she got a great record and then she made the jump. Yeah. That, you know, those things are going to happen rarely, but Invicta is going to do all the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. On that note, you can find me on Twitter at Zane Simon. You can find Vic on Twitter at Vic M. Rodriguez. You can find Dio on Twitter at I'm Just Dio. You can find Vic and I over at bloodyelbow.com. Dio used to be there. He is not anymore. He does I am floating now. in the aether. And uh, we will be back next week to talk about more MMA. We'll probably there's probably another fight card coming up next week. It's not a UFC yeah. card. I'll be back with MMA depressed us, and mm. we will have heavy hands and six round retro, and if I did it, and all that stuff that we do normally week in week out. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Give us a like over on YouTube. That's a thumbs up. Yeah. Subscribe to our YouTube channel MMANation.com. D O T C O M. All spelled out. Both those things help us a ton. We appreciate it, and we will see y'all soon. All right.